Hello everybody. Welcome to the Royal Holloway Geography for Schools and Access News. This talk is entitled One City, Two Worlds, The Making of Mumbai Has Entered Global City. Uh, I'm a lecturer in Royal Holloway Geography Department and I'm a development geographer who researches mainly on cities. Most of my research has been in Mumbai, which is my hometown where I was born and brought up. So it's a real pleasure to be present this lecture uh, for the school's lecture series. So the main objective of this lecture today is to outline the contemporary urban environment and characteristics of a mega world city from a global perspective, from the global south, highlighting social and economic inequalities associated with urbanization. In doing so, it looks at the scale and pace of economic migration that has increased from rural to urban area, which has created consequences for people and their everyday physical environment. It analyzes the intersections of social and infrastructural inequalities, the conflicts, um, the tensions that accompany them, and the effects of poverty and wealth on infrastructural provision and uh, provision and how they are, how these provisions are, are accessed. It reviews social and economic issues associated with urbanization, how city space has changed over time, making places uh, for everyday um, everyday living and survival, how the city is experienced by its citizens. And then it looks at urban problems, it presents them in the context of broader global developmental process and explores the range of urban development and planning challenges faced by governments and um, governments and population. So in, in this talk, I want to look at uh, processes that take place in cities of the global south. These are wider processes. Though I'm concentrating on Mumbai in this talk, I am wanting to sort of bring together the wider processes that take place in cities around the world, both in the global south as well as in the global north. And so there are some parallels that you may perhaps even recognize from your own experiences. So the first thing that I want to sort of look at is sort of how urbanization has brought about an emerging middle classes and how that has brought about some rising inequalities within the city and how we look forward in the future in thinking about sustainability and the pressures on the urban environment that are generated. So this picture here of the slide is very much a, a skyline of, of Mumbai. It very much highlights the value of the real estate that, that it it comprises of and the value that, that it poses on some of, of the very prime land uh, within, within Mumbai itself. Mumbai as a city is seen as an engine of growth and many cities around the world are viewed in that perspective. Cities are key drivers of regional and national development. They have the capacity to generate economic growth and prosperity and contribute to GDP of each country. These are emerging markets in global markets itself. They are interconnected with global economy. They are interconnected with the globalization process. It's complex, multifaceted globalization process, which absorbs a lot of the economic migrants who move from the rural areas to the urban areas. I won't go into the details of why people are being pushed from rural areas to urban areas, but more and more economic migrants are migrants who look for jobs and who are economic migrants who are looking for survival and making a livelihood in the city. So it creates a competition for scarce resources such as land, water, and sanitation, which are different infrastructural services, which I will be concentrating on on in this talk. How do people make a living? Most of the people who are economic migrants make a living through the informal sector. It is through small-scale livelihoods, 
like in this slide where there's a picture of a market where there are various vendors selling shoes, books, uh, shirts, vegetables, and this is an informal sector. Small scale livelihoods, labor intensive, low levels of skills are required. Most of the economic migrants might even have low literacy levels, low technological skills, and also low productivity. They're mainly self-employed in informal enterprises. So that's one way of looking at making a living. The other ways is where people work on a casual basis as a day laborer on construction sites or in a company or in a factory. They could be contractor workers with zero or contracts with part time or either temporary contract income. So it's a very flexible labor market which has access to income earning opportunities for migrants, but it is highly competitive. So it's flexible, it, it, it can also have hire and fire rules, which means that many of the many of the migrants do not have the security of their livelihoods. So livelihood strategies are very much about ensuring survival in the city itself. Many of the women participate in the informal sector. There's a high number of women participation, particularly in, in sort of marketplace as there is on this on this slide. So what we are seeing is an intersection between capitalism and urbanization processes. The global processes which are which are which are con contributing to the labor supply, uh, global processes which are making um, uh, you know different different markets in the global south are also producing the, the intersection between capitalism and urbanization processes. The interconnectedness between the formal and the informal sector is something that you could also look at, is how the formal sector subcontracting that goes into the informal sector. So if you could take an example of a garment industry, which might, might actually subcontract to an informal sector to put buttons on the shirt, or you could say, in a, or, or make certain parts of, of, uh, of a trousers uh, or t-shirts and so on and so forth. So you can see how subcontracting can take place from the formal sector to the informal sector. And that interconnectedness also exists uh, between the intersection between capitalism and urbanization process. So urbanization creates connected and cascading effects. Um, you can see this by the expansion of slums and squatter settlements exhibiting socioeconomic Here's an overview of a slum from Mumbai itself. It shows the expansion of, this, of the place, how over a period of time it's grown uh, in the last 20, in the last 40 to 50 years. It also shows a lack of provision of critical infrastructure such as water and sanitation, which leads to potential risk of, for health and well-being of people living in the city. It also highlights the unevenness of the process of that reconfiguration, the intersection between social inequality, infrastructure, and service provision at the neighborhood level. So what are these shortages that are created? And I'm going to just run through a few to get, you, get a sense of how this inequality a sort of manifests itself within the city. The first shortage is obviously the housing shortage. Economic migrants who cannot find cheap, affordable housing to live. So there's a high population density which within city which generates a shortage of affordable housing, contributing to social exclusion from the bigger housing market itself. And there's competition for scarce resources, uh, such as land, and which leads to poor living and working conditions that most of these economic migrants land up living in. So slums like these become quite, uh, qu uh, quite um, popular amongst economic migrants who come and live uh, over, uh, over in the city. You see, as, as they consolidate their position within, within, the, within the slums, the structures get better, the structure of the housing gets a little bit better as, as decades pass. 
This slum you can see is also next to a, another high rise building. And you can see that, that poorer communities lived very close next to the high rise, high end housing markets as well. Most of the characteristics of slum housing is where there is overcrowding. You can see from the overview pictures that I've shown so far that there are more people living per house. There is very little, um, sometimes very little legality, though more and more governments are assuring tenure and security for many of these slum dwellers. This is a labor supply that cities need. Cities need uh, migrants to work in, in these global processes or the global markets that exist or the global processes of productivity that takes place within the city. Most of these housings are built on precarious land sites, such as the one on the right here, which talks about uh, on, on a marshy land, or on a landfill site, or next to a railway sidings, or hill slopes, or ravines, or riverbanks. Most of them lack services and access to infrastructure. There's very limited piped clean water, sanitation facilities, toilets, wastewater disposal or waste garbage disposal, paved road, garbage collections, or electric lighting uh, within, uh, within these slums. What it leads to is also a lot of speculation. Not only speculation is in the high-end housing market, but also in the lower-end housing market. Most people try to, to accumulate resources over a period of time. It's good to perhaps look at David Harvey's book called Accumulation by Dispossession, The New Interior. His main argument is that as people try to accumulate wealth, they also perhaps dispose other, other wealth um, or, or other people from the same wealth. So it is, it is looking, at, looking at this argument we're going to look through how speculation affects certain land, uh, land um, processes within the city of Mumbai. It also highlights how infrastructure and service creates threats to security of tenure for slums. As slums are developed, they become more secure. As the land gets more legalized, i.e. ownership of, of slums going to the, to the owners of people who live there, as that becomes much more legal, as uh, people argue for more and um, more services such as water and sanitation and the more stable and better the environment gets, the more threat there is of they getting more and more evicted as more people want the same kind of, of uh, services itself. This process is far less, un uh, less understood and there's more research that is being done on the rental processes within cities and the speculations within slums, which creates displacement for people itself. So as land becomes an important commodity, there is a huge amount of market-driven evictions that takes place. Displacement can take place because of development itself. Mumbai wants to look like Shanghai. Uh, you know, government policies to making it, looking it beautiful, greener, you know, for having developmental projects like building metros, roads, airports, leads to large-scale displacement of people. Slums and squatter settlements are, 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 are completely displaced for large-scale infrastructure itself. So displacement and dispossession can take place as certain land becomes of importance to the government or, or to, to the developers itself. So the mechanization of eviction includes rising land values, rising rents, and change in land use. As more people want land, as more rental accommodation is needed in particular localities, the more speculation takes place. So market evictions are often not monitored and recorded because they become as private properties, private um, arrangements that are made with developers itself, only when the land is owned by the state is when the state gets involved. 
it is the consequences of a housing policy or is it a consequences of a developmental process? Remember, I started this talk talking about wider processes. And these wider processes have an impact on how development takes place within the city and the conflicts that arise and how displacement and displa uh, displacement and dispossession can alienate the poorest of the poor. One of the policies within, um, within Mumbai is about slum rehabilitation, trying to rehabilitate slums which live in very uh, poor conditions in some. On the right, on the, the picture on the slide is of a rehabilitation scheme where slums was demolished and, uh, and people were housed in, in these tall, high, tall buildings, uh, giving them uh, a, a small uh, apartment itself. So slum relocation can also take place where, where especially when there are big developmental projects like airports, um, or, or building of roads, um, building of uh, metros, when people are, uh, are um, when slums are evicted and they are relocated. And sometimes it can be at the periphery of the city. So it can lead to resettlements far away uh, from the main cities or far away from where they particularly live. So the processes of speculation and dispossession highlight the practices that shape land security and insecurity that is being generated, and thereby the claims and conflicts over the urban space, the conflicts that generate over the urban space. Here is an example of the new metros uh, that are being put in, in, in Mumbai. There's lots of places where, um, you know, it's, people have been evicted, um, lots of places where developmental projects have led to a displacement of people. Now you think that slums live in one part of the city and perhaps you know the affluent community lives on the other. But if you look in Mumbai or in many cities of the world today, high-rise affluent areas are very much next to the slums in Mumbai as well. And you can see that this spatial fragmentation is increasingly differentiated the societal and spatial polarization between the city and the self. And then there is a threat to social cohesiveness as well. And you see this by my next slide, which basically highlights how a new project has taken place. Here there is a high-rise building of an affluent area, which, which is a gentrified area, displacing some of the slum communities and building, uh, building high-rise apartments. There are also uh, gated communities with lots of security, very much uh, seen in other parts of the world, such as in South Africa, in Cape Town, or in Brazil and in Sao Paulo, uh, just to give some examples. So social fragmentation is also taking place where there are gated communities within the cities itself. There's a culture of fear, fear uh, about living next to, to slum communities uh, itself. You can see some of these very affluent uh, apartment blocks have got swimming pools, nice green um, green vegetation, uh, making it look better and, and, and quite um, upmarket. This is a picture of, uh, just to give you an example, a picture from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So this picture was taken 18 years ago by Cuca Vieira, uh, highlighting uh, some of the uh, some of the, the disparities that exist in the city, you know, contrast between balconies with swimming pools and lush tennis courts below or next to a uh, to a favela in Brazil as well. This picture, you know, highlighted the inequality uh, about 18 years ago, and this completely persists in many parts of the world as well. There's also a different way in which the city is experienced. So here we started with this picture of the informal sector on on your right, which basically talks about you know the the markets that most of the slum dwellers would use or the poorer urban communities would use. On the left of the slide it, it, it is a, a mall uh, which has got all the branded um, uh, branded um, consumer goods that you could buy, uh, and it, it 
it's where most of the middle classes or the upper middle classes would shop. So a different shopping experience within the same city itself. But if you look at South slums, it's in, in, in within within Mumbai. There's a lot of inadequate toilets and sanitary facilities. And because there are inadequate toilets and sanitary facilities, there's a huge amount of open defecation that also takes place within the city. And sanitation shares a relationship with a lot of child mortality of under age five. And, and if you look, you can look at some of the statistics, look at Mumbai census data from 2021 or 2011. And you can also see that many children uh, who suffer from diarrhea or malaria and disease such as these lose school days, people working population lose working days and so on and so forth. So you can see that the impact of not having adequate facilities or infrastructure facilities on the day-to-day -day everyday living of people in the slums. You also see that slums are living in very precarious environments, which are in a densely populated, uh, crammed in one location. Uh, there are waterborne diseases which, which have an impact on health, as I talked about earlier. Uh, lack of wastewater disposal, uh, which also has an impact on the environment in which they live and they breathe uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, diarrhea is one of the top 10 killers around the world. These are drains that are not emptied. There's no waste disposal. And so you can see again here that infrastructure facilities are very limited for slums and squatter settlements, which, which leads to um, a lot of... Um, Health related issues. And there's uh, outdoor air pollution, uh, which, which is also encountered uh, in, in these localities itself. And there is very limited water that is available. People get water for a couple of hours a day and then it has to be stored. And so there's a politics of provision itself. Here, they have the high rise, wealthy, affluent buildings get 24 hours water supply, whereas well the slums, squatter settlements get very little, uh, little water supply or maybe a limited hours in a day itself. There's a huge pressure on the city municipality to, to expand the water network itself. So who gets water? Who can afford to buy water? Is itself a very political struggle within many cities of the world. In July 2010, UN General Assembly adopted a res resolution that recognized that the right to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation as a human right that is essential for a full enjoyment of life and human and all human rights. So, provision of infrastructure is a fundamental human right, and it's also right to the city. As you need the labor market. For the city, you need to provide the rights uh, rights for individual to have access to affordable water, sanitation, and housing uh, infrastructure. Many of you must have seen the film Slumdog Millionaire, which is based on Mumbai itself. But here, I also wanted to point out about the urban health issues in relation to the environment in which slums live. We live in a very hyper-connected world, which has uh, pathogens that are carried from one city to another, from one neighborhood to another. Recently, we have seen a lot of large-scale outbreaks, such as Ebola uh, in 2014, Zika in 2016, and of course, COVID-19, which is very much uh, in, our, in our mind, uh, having just recovered from it uh, for many of us. Um, what is the effect of living uh, in this environment? What are the cumulative effects of resilience and endured vulnerability on mental health? Very little research is done on mental health issues of slums and, and the vulnerability that they endure over their lifetime. The stresses of surviving, the long-term chronic stresses over a lifetime, the exposure to stressful life events of living in the city. The day-to-day -day coping strategies of accessing water, uh, sanitation, uh, jobs, livelihoods, etc. So the role of infrastructure has a huge impact on everyday living. It fosters social and spatial inequality. 
and identifies the differential development of the city spaces. I highlighted the two different spaces in which people live. Though they're living next to each other, they experience the city in a very different way. This is the messy realities of everyday life within its uncontrollable flows. The inequality that persists, the speculation that persists, the accessibility to affordable services, which is becoming more difficult day by day, and the environmental hazards of living in, in these sort of cramped, um, uh, polluted areas itself, and the high prevalence of infectious diseases. Households matter. How do urban poor resilient uh, become resilient over a period of time? But they are more and more vulnerable and they are more at risk in this urban environment itself. So urban poverty in the global south cities is a complex real reality. There is a lot of underestimation of the scale of the urban poverty itself and also an underestimation the intergenerational poverty that exists for people living in, in cities. So let's recap some of the characteristics of that urban poverty. One is that it is relying on the labor market. Um, the city relies on the labor market. Uh, that labor market which works in the informal sector, which is casualized, which is subcontracted, which does not have a secure livelihood itself uh, persistently throughout their lifetime. They live in a poor quality of housing, which is insecure, and there's a lot of displacement that can take place. There's a lack of access to public infrastructure and affordable services and susceptible to diseases itself. They have environmental hazards in everyday living brought out by uh, speculative land prices, but also with lack of infrastructure facilities. Urban poor people are vulnerable and insecure, and they are exposed to marginalization, injustice, and in exclusion inscribed into the life of the city. What the city's example, the city of Mumbai example, highlights is the manifestation of vulnerability over a period of time. The emphasis on multiple depri deprivation, low income, insecure jobs, poor housing, limited access to affordable services. And so there is, there is a greater need to understand the multidimensional, the, the multidimensionality of this poverty in, in cities of the global south. So to recap and to bring the whole talk uh, to a conclusion, there are a few things that I wanted to highlight. One was that to understand the social spatial inequalities that shape and are in turn shaped by the evolution of a very capitalist urbanization. Secondly, is to understand the spatial politics of land claims and class interest. Third, is to invest in, in essential sustainable infrastructure that propels growth and human development. We need an integrated approach to delivering services such as water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities. And local governments have a big role to play, which needs a technical and managerial skills and ability to engage with the public and strong capacities to design and implement, monitor, and evaluate local public policies and services. The photographs that I showed in this in this talk are all my own photographs only only when they are and when only when unless otherwise stated um, thank you very much i hope you've enjoyed this talk um, and look forward to seeing you at all holidays sometime thank you bye for now